Welcome to One on One with Mitch Lafon. And joining me on this episode, it is guitarist Monty Pittman. We talk about his new solo album, Inverted Grasp of Balance. We also talk about his time with Prong and Madonna. Before checking that out, please check me out on Twitter at Mitch Lafon, M I T C H L A F O N. One on One, Mitch Lafon on Facebook and paypal.me forward slash Mitch Lafon, should you care to support the podcast. Coming right up is Monty Pittman. But first, this. Hello, this is Simone from Epica, and you're listening to One on One with Mitch Lafon. Rock on. And now, the one, the only, guitarist Monty Pittman. We are speaking with guitarist Monty Pittman. The new album is Inverted Grasp of Balance. Good day, sir. How are you doing, Mitch? Good to hear from you. Good. Pleasure to hear from you. Uh, lots of great stuff to talk about. There's obviously the new album. There is your house gig with the L.A. Kiss. And, of course, being Prong's former guitarist and, and all that wonderful stuff. So let's let's get right into this. Let's talk about the album. Yeah, let's talk about the album first. Um, you know, uh, you, you've been doing touring with Madonna. You, you're in that sort of pop world. What made you decide that, okay, I need to get back in the studio and do sort of a metal album that's going to end up on uh, Metal Blade Records and just sort of rock out? Well, it's nothing that happened overnight. Um, when I moved to L.A. back, I mean, 16 and a half years ago now, um, that was my plan. Well, I didn't really have a plan. I would either like join a band or start a band or something, but it just so happened that right after I got to LA I, I would I went back the first year I moved uh, to LA I would go back and forth between Prong and Madonna and then that was a big you know part of the early 2000s it's like once one was done working the other one would be starting up um, and then I, I, I started a band finally and it was really hard getting everybody together because I found some of the best I knew and uh, my, uh, my my singer went on American uh, American Idol. His name's Adam Lambert. I think you've heard of him by now. <laughs> yeah, I've and heard of that so little guy. It, yeah, it was kind of back to the drawing board. And so I started playing out on my own. So I started playing acoustically so I could book gigs. I mean, because that's why I moved to L.A. Uh, and then there was a progression of, you know, then I made a second album. Uh, and it was kind of a hybrid acoustic rock album. And then I made... The Power of Three, which I made a heavy album just to do it because I, I was working with Fleming Rasmussen, and um, and he suggested because I gave him all my demos, and he suggested that I start, um, you know, that, that we record these heavy songs. That's what's got me to sign to Metal Blade, and then you know now this is my first album with Metal Blade on board from day one. And, you know, it, there's a, naturally a progression when you play and when you write. And from pushing my guitar playing and pushing my writing, I just I wanted to write, you know, one of the, the heaviest thing that I could because I, I love that kind of music. And I wanted to add that to what I do. And it's sort of just, you know, it's built up to this. Yeah. Now, now you mentioned Fleming. Of course, he worked on Metallica's early albums and he's got sort of that reputation. Um, what do you learn from a guy that's had that pedigree uh, to play uh, to, to, to not just get a perfect performance out of what you're doing. Well, not necessarily getting a perfect performance out of what you're doing, but getting the emotion and the aggression. Like when we were tracking with Fleming, like we'd be like, man, okay, yeah, we nailed that. And he'd be like, no, nope, do it again. It's like, what? It was fine. It's like, I oh, know, come on, do it again. And you would play in a way you're like, all right, I'm going to show you, you know. <laughs> and then that was, and then he'd be like, yep, okay, that was the take. Yeah, and, and that's the way to do it. So, um, so talk to me about the sort of the different styles that you that yet you work with. You, you had that album um, that we were talking about just before here, the Deepest Dark, which was all acoustic. Now you're doing all metal. Do you sort of see yourself um, doing anything you want? in terms of music, like the next album might be a pop record or is is metal sort of the first love? Yeah, metal's the first love. There won't be a pop record. Uh, the next album will be another continuation of Inverted Grass for Balance mm -hmm. and, uh, and we'll keep taking it from there. Um, you know, eventually one day I want to do an acoustic album of, um, 
you know, just what I've learned about recording and songwriting, um, because I've learned so much since the deepest dark. And, um, and then, you know, at the end of the day in my live show, maybe I'll do like one or two acoustic songs, like when a band, you know, does that or like how, you know, Alice in Chains maybe, or, or, you know, I saw Guns N' Roses recently and like, you know, they, you know, they have their whole set, but then they do patience, you know, also, you know, so that's where that fits in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I keep, I'm going to keep, you know, chipping away at this. Before we, we, we deviate to, to kiss and all that other stuff. Um, sure. You mentioned the Guns N' Roses show, and I'm just asking you, as, as, as an artist who's done the bigger shows, mm-hmm. you know, with Madonna and with Adam and all that, what did you think of that gun show? Because for, for me, who I, I, I see about 100 shows a year. I think it was absolutely the best show out there in 2016. I, th- I thought it well, I saw them in da- I saw them in I I thought it was one of the best concerts I'd ever seen. Yeah. Uh, I'd have to I agree. thought they were awesome. And I mean I loved everything about it. You know that people have their opinions one way or another, but I think that all of those things are what makes it what it is. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. So, um talk to me about working with the different artists. Now, you know, when you look at Prong, they're working on a smaller scale. They're doing club shows, they're doing theater shows, and then you're working with an artist like Madonna. How is it for you in terms of a guitarist? Do you prepare yourself differently? Um, just talk to me sort of about, about that experience with those different bands. Well, I always said that Prong and Madonna have more similarities than people realize because um, Prong is kind of like heavy dance music in a way. You know, because they were, you know, known as an industrial band. Well, they've they've gone through several um, modifications, you know, over the years. Uh, and um, you know, with Madonna, you do every style of music, just about. You know, there's always some distorted guitar. I mean, we actually did on this last tour, on the Rebel Heart tour, a somewhat, I mean, dare I say, a heavy version of Burning Up. Like the guitars were distorted. Madonna was using a, a uh, a Kemper uh, profile of Kerry King's signature amp, um, but then the but then the drums and the keyboards were all just like the album. And she likes to mix things together like that. And uh, if you look back at some of her stuff, she's always kind of had that. You know, and Michael Jackson was the same way. I mean, he had, you know there was like what you call you know rock guitars. You know, of course it's not like you know Slayer, but. Right, um, right. And, and yes, um, I, I've un- unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, that's a, the bad word, but I, I've had to follow Madonna's career because my wife is a huge fan. And so uh, awesome. I, I, I've heard, in fact, uh, when our daughter was born, uh, Madonna was supposed to play in Montreal and she, she had to choose between giving birth and going to Madonna. Giving birth finally won out, but <laughs> she, she debated it for many, many hours that she was going to try to hold on. But, um, you know, as a, a hired gun, you know, Jason Hook of Five Finger Death Punch just did this movie about hired guns. Uh, talk to me about that sort of career and what it's like to be on stage in these big situations and still sort of be anonymous. Yeah, that's kind of great because you can, um, you know, you, you get to play this huge show and then you, uh, you, you can just walk down the street afterwards and go do whatever you want. You know, like uh, I heard Kiss talk about that back in in the in the day, like with their makeup is like they could go do these shows. And then when people didn't know what they look like without their makeup, they could just go, you know, wherever. <laughs> so so what does it mean for you creatively, though, though? Because uh, when you're in a situation like that, do you have any input? Can you say we need to turn up the guitars? Can you say we need to do this? And, and if not, um is that where the sort of the solo career becomes the creative outlet for you? Well, with, with Madonna, that's one of the reasons that she puts you there is, you know, to contribute your ideas. Um, there've been, uh, there was a, there was a time on a tour in 2012. We had these guys with us, the Calican trio, they're three singers from France and they kind of didn't know if they should speak up, of course. And then she, she's like, no, I, I want to know your, what, what you would do here. It's like we're all, we all work together. So, I mean, there's the things that are going to be just, you know, always the new songs are played just like the record. But uh, after, you know, if, 
you know, after a song's been out for a while, it'll it could be redone to fit the show. It's all got to fit the show and the theme of the show. Right. right. So it does that. It's not anything like you're being heavy or doing a remix or anything like that just for the sake of doing it. It's how it's going to fit with the overall performance because it's not just a concert. It's almost like a theater show also. Right? And like performance art. Like all those things put together. Yeah, and, and that, that, for, that, that's... For so- Prong... Yeah, yeah. For for prong, when I first joined, you know, I was playing guitar and I would just double Tommy, and um, so live and, and me and Tommy can play in a way where we we're just exactly on top of each other, right? and um, where it sounds like one big guitar. Uh, and then I and I came back later on and I played bass in prong, so I've got to see it from different angles. Yeah, you're sort of like the Bruce Kulick of prong. You got at some point you get to play bass on the albums. Um, with Take Adam, that as a huge compliment. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Bruce is fantastic. Um, yes, he is. With Adam Lambert, you also were hired as his musical director. Um, yeah. You know, I know what that means, but for those listening, what what does musical director mean, and and what were sort of your tasks where working with Adam? Uh, just keeping it, you know, uh, being in charge of all the music, being the one person to kind of go to. And that's another thing where, you know, everybody worked together also. It wasn't like, okay, here's your part, you're going to play it. You know, there was, it was very open of like, you know, let's do the song, but then let's add this to it and let's jam and do this. We're, we're changing things on the road a lot. Because there there is that misconception that, a lot of the pop artists are just running tape and they're just, you know, lip syncing the whole night long. And I just, Oh, he's definitely not lip syncing. <laughs> right. But but there is that perception. So is it important as a musical director to, to show um, that it's a live show and, 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 you know, to change up the album versions just enough so that people realize, hey, this is not, uh, you know, we're not running tape today. It's not a Pro Tools event tonight. Yeah, what what I wanted to add to that was sort of add that live band feel because with some of that electronic music, it, it sounds great in your car, or it sounds great when you're listening to the track. But then live, it just sort of there's something kind of missing out. There, there's some there's you need that sort of ACDC element that plug in and play to go in there, and that's what works live. Right. That's why that band in particular have. Uh, lasted so long is because it works for a live show that and 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 rock bands you know, like that's why that works so well so you're gonna add a little bit of all those elements together yeah now the the other thing that I know about you is you are a huge huge kiss fan uh, as am oh, I. Yeah. Uh, so so talk to me a little bit about how you discovered them and sort of what they've meant to you. Um, that was the first, that's where it all started for me. Uh, you know, I was, I was one of those kids, you know, this isn't the only story you've heard about this. That's for sure of, you know, I was, I was three, I had a toy guitar standing on my sister's bed playing her kiss records. And that's where it all started. That's why I've always just wanted to play guitar. I've never thought about anything else. I mean, I wish now that maybe I would have gone to college also and learned how to be a breast augmentation doctor but you know i was too busy playing shows and and doing stuff like that but um yeah that's uh you know that that's uh that's where it all started for me and a lot of people so so what was sort of the first album for you that that from kiss that made you decide okay i need to get into this well my sister had uh she had everything after dress to kill right and then I had the cassette of Dynasty, because that's when I was old enough to sort of get it, and, and I loved that. That was my favorite. Uh, that's, that was my favorite one. Well, maybe Rock and Roll Over. I don't know. I loved everything they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm with you on that one. Um, the L.A. Kiss uh, halftime band that you that you're with with Matt Starr, who of course plays drums with Ace Frehley. Yeah, uh, he's awesome. He, absolutely. I, I did a charity record a few years ago, and he uh, volunteered to drum on it. So uh, you can only uh, have respect for Matt. Um, talk to me about that gig and, and what, what that entails. Um, yeah, we play. We... <laughs> oh, yeah, there's an ambulance coming. Um, 
there was uh, there was, you know, we do a set of like slow songs uh, at the beginning of the uh, like right when doors open and when the other team is on the field, so we can like bum them out. <laughs> and then we play throughout the uh, you know we play throughout the game like at half. T- I mean at kickoff. I mean timeouts. You know, kick off stuff like that, and then we do a couple songs at halftime, and then after, uh, at, when, when the game's over, the the fans can come down on the field and get pictures with the players and the cheerleaders. And when Gene and Paul are there, they sign stuff, and and then we do the, you know, the, the full on rock set, which is you know Zeppelin and um, Alice in Chains, ACDC, all that kind of stuff. A little bit of everything. We do some Kiss songs. It's great. What a, what a great gig. And, and it goes oh, I to love show, it. It's so cool. It, it goes to show that, you know, you have to keep working. And, you know, as a working musician, every gig is a great gig. Um, I want to go back to Prong for a bit. Uh, Power of the Damager from yeah. uh, 2007. Uh, you had been with the band at that point, I guess, three albums or four albums. And, you know, you did get guitar and bass and and on that one, on Power of the Damager, you became more of a writer, having c- contributed five songs on there. Um, talk to me about writing for uh, Prong and what it was like to, to sort of spread your wings on that album. Yeah, well, me and Tommy would just sit in a room and, um, and, and you know, the band I talked to you about that I had with, with Adam, Tommy was the bass player. Right. And... Um, so we, we we were playing together a lot then, with different things, and um, and we would just sit in Tommy's rehearsal room and just keep coming up with riffs and keep writing. And then there was a couple of things that uh, I would make a demo of at home, like "Can't Stop the Bleeding" was something like Tommy had had written written um, he'd like started a demo of it, and then I made another demo of it, you know, adding some riffs in there, and then he really liked that. And then we would just get together and and sit and play guitar, and that's kind of how it came about. You also had uh, Al Jorgensen on that album from Ministry. He he is just one of these sort of uh, crazy talented people. What's it like having Al uh, working with you? Oh, awesome! Yeah, I, I love any time I get the chance to work with Al. He's awesome. We get along great. Um, you know, you it's somebody that. I love any time you can be around somebody who has really done it and learn from them and see their opinions and just see how they do things. And a lot of these people, what it is, they practice a lot and they put a lot into that rehearsal. So where do you... in, in the details. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They just they, they, they sweat those details. Now, uh, you had power of three in 2014 and you had an album in 2013 and 2012. I mean, you sort of do these one a year. Uh, is that where you see yourself in terms of 2017, you know, sort of working a little bit on Inverted and then moving on to the next new album? Um, Maybe, you know, I mean, I guess 2017 or 2018. I'm just I haven't thought about it. I'm too busy trying to get this one out. And after this one comes out, will you be out touring to support it? Man, I hope so. You know, if somebody next step is we've got to get, you know, a booking agent. Right. Which hopefully after when this album comes out, somebody is going to jump on and then take, you know, get me out with an opening act. Yeah, that would be great. Um, in terms of uh, the, the performances, you know, when you're with Adam and when you're with Madonna, they do all the singing. They, you know, they take care of that stuff. Do you find it more complicated to sort of put everything together and also be the singer on the album? Oh, yeah, because I've got all of the work to do. I don't have anyone to push anything else off on it's been it it completely consumes me like the people around me like right before the album's coming out like you know you're so quiet you're not talking and what's what's going on everything i was like sorry i'm just thinking of everything i've got to do and it's it's a full-time job just just that and i teach guitar lessons too uh, I started teaching online guitar lessons and I've got a lot of students and there's no, you know, when you do that, there's no, like, you don't just start your lesson. There's hours of preparation and writing things out, scanning things, getting ready so I can email it to them and like planning out what you're going to do, reviewing what you went through before. So it's, it, everything is just a complete, you know, 24 hour job. 
Yeah, and so so what is eventually the the end game for you? Is it sort of to s- still be a touring musician working with Madonna or whoever the new person might be down the road, or at some point do you see yourself just sort of laying low in L.A. and working on musical scores and and films and what is sort of the long term plan? Man, I don't know. I want to just keep putting out music, keep surviving. I mean, because it, it's weird to look back and say. You know, I, I've survived because people ask me that. They say, what do you want to be known for and things like that? And, you know, I guess one thing would be like versatility, but is somehow surviving as a professional guitar player for this long, for 16 years. And uh, and one of the th- reasons is versatility, you know, because uh, there's been times where someone would say they're looking for a gig and you could say, oh, hey, well, this person's looking for a guitar player or a bass player or a drummer or something. And they're like, Oh yeah, I don't like their music though. It's like, yeah, but what if, who knows who you're going to meet? You know, you may play in a band and you meet the bass player. And then like two years from that, from then they may say like, Hey man, I, I need a guitar player. And I was thinking about playing with you and you, you'd be perfect for this. And you just, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, I've, I have never know. I mean, if you told me all this was going to happen, I would think you were crazy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you can't say no to a gig. I mean, I, my, my that's favorite what I, story is always Jason Hook, Mandy Moore, Hillary Duff, Alice Cooper, and now Five Finger Death Punch. I mean, you, you just sort of got to go with, you just got to sort of keep working, keep your name out yeah, there. I always tell everybody it's bad luck to turn down a gig. That's You're sending out into the universe that. You know, you may not want to do something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Inverted Grasp of Balance is coming out in September. I've heard a few tracks, and uh, it it sounds slamming. I mean, it really sounds slamming. And the artwork Thank is you. absolutely phenomenal. I love Thank that you. artwork. I, I don't know who did it, but it's brilliant. Uh, Sean, Sean K. Hughes well, is his name. And um, amazing artist. I met him. Uh, he worked as a bartender at the Black Rabbit in Melbourne, Australia. And I saw his artwork, and I was just like, "Whoa!" And um, this is the you know, this is the first time that I've been able to work on an album until I was just completely like, "Okay, there's nothing else." Like, there's no like, "Here's our studio time," and then after this amount of time, that you know, whatever we get done, that's it. You know, I can just keep working on things. If I go, man, you know, this is kind of bothering me. I wish I would have played it this way. Now that I hear it in the big picture. And I could work on it. I could get it just right. And also with the artwork, uh, it wasn't a, a piece of art that I licensed or, you know, or just or got from an artist that was already created. This, I gave the lyrics to Sean, and I'm like, here's the lyrics. Now draw this. And um, you know, I had the time and I had the ability to, to do that. Yeah, and it turned out great. And by the way, you just mentioned the lyrics. Yeah. In terms of being a guitar player, what to you is more important? Is it is it just sort of throwing in a thousand notes, or lyrically it has to make sense too? Oh yeah, lyrically it has to make sense, and I want the songs to sort of fit together with a theme. There's other songs that I had them saving for the next record because they just they were completely different, like they didn't fit on the album. And I was like, okay, I'll let those marinate for a little while longer. And I may come back to them, and I may record those exactly how it is on the demo, or I may, um, I may not. I may completely change them. Okay, well, there you go. And of course, uh, I guess now we're we're done. I know you have another interview, but soon it'll be cold gin time for you. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Always, always a pleasure. Uh, thank I, you. I, I just. I just wrote that on Facebook just as a joke. I said, my heater's broke. I'm so tired. I said, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I don't know what to tell you. And they're like, someone wrote, you okay? I'm sorry to hear why your heart's broke. I'm like, no, no, my heater, it's a KISS reference. Come on. <laughs> I know. I, I, I saw that on Facebook, on Twitter, and I responded to both. And it, it, was, it was funny because I, I was reading it going, everybody thinks this poor guy's depressed. He's just singing a KISS tune in his head. I mean, <laughs> cut him some slack. <laughs> But, uh, I was yeah. a little, little jet lagged and sleep deprived, also. Yeah, but we. Yeah, I, I have a bizarre, twisted, stupid sense of humor. So. <laughs> no, it works great, and, and uh, the album keeps me sane. The, the The album is great. The the songs I've heard Thank you. are are absolutely phenomenal. What's I'm trying to think, which is the one I that really um that's the single "Pride Comes Before the Fall." Jesus Christ, that's slamming. That is a great song. 
Yeah, I wanted that to be kind of the first thing that everybody heard because Smart it kind of, kind of sums up everything yeah. and the way it builds. Yeah. You know, and I knew it was going to be the artwork uh, video because, um, you know, there's other things, you know, I'll, we'll give away other things as it as we get closer. No, that no, that was uh, that was the the proper choice. Well done. And uh, should you ever come to Canada, I can certainly help you book an Ottawa and Toronto gig. So please uh, drop me a note and I'll help you with that. Um, and there we go. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Ha- have awesome, a- awesome, man. Good to hear from you, dude. And uh, I will uh, I'll hope to speak to you again soon. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks so much, man. Cheers. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it, folks, my interview with guitarist Monty Pittman. Please remember to check me out on Twitter at Mitch Lafon, M-I-T-C-H-L-A-F-O-N, paypal.me forward slash Mitch Lafon, and Facebook, one-on-one Mitch Lafon. Thanks for listening, and I will be back with another episode very soon. Bye for now. Oh, my. <laughs>